for us as Muslims, we don't, don't look down upon any individual, even non-Muslims, subhanAllah, even non-Muslims don't think that we're better than... Based on our actions and this moment, our Iman, we don't know are we going to Jannah or not. We don't know if they're going to Jahannam or not. So we need to look at every individual as a possibility that it's possible and mumkin that that person can become Muslim, become better than me, excel me. And Allah forbid, Allah forbid, I could lose my Iman and I could end up going in the depths of Jahannam. Okay? So this is why it's essential for a Muslim, a believer, a person who says La ilaha illallah to always have good hopes on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never feel content. Hence even there were some ulama that were mentioning that even at the moment they don't regard themselves filhal at this current moment right now as even better than people who are disbelievers and kuffar. Why? Because I don't know, this is, I'm relaying that scholar's words, what he said eloquently. But I don't know at this moment whether when I leave this dunya, I'm leaving with Iman or not. And I don't know for sure whether he's going to die with it without Iman or not. So based on this premise, I can't say I'm better than any individual. I, you ask me a question, do I regard myself as better than non-believers? No. Not, I can't say I'm better now, because I can only say who will die with Iman. Yeah, the fact that I understand my Allah, the fact that I said kalima la ilaha illallah, the fact that I say Muhammadur Rasulullah gives me an edge in terms of my Iman. Iman, yes, we can definitely say that. I'm not going to say sabra, but that's not the, the case at all. Someone who recognizes Allah and acknowledges Allah, acknowledges Rasulullah, you can't say he's exactly the same as someone, Iman, who doesn't believe in Allah. Is that a fair point? What do you reckon? If you've got someone who does shirk and worships idols and someone who's a muahid, are we going to say they're both equal? Of course not. It's not possible. But I'm, the thing is, we can't say for sure who's going to go Jannah and who's going to go Jahannam. At this moment in time, we can't say that for sure because we don't know who's going to die with Iman and without Iman. And when a person dies and goes in the court of Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, then we will see for sure. This is why it's important. Forget looking at that upon non-Muslims. If we can't look at non-Muslims like this, now you ask, let me ask you a question. How then can we look down upon Muslim brothers, Muslim sisters? Unfortunately, a lot of tafriq exists within the Muslim Ummah. A lot of ikhtilaf. And it generally boils down to a lot of khair. I don't want to go into it too much depth, but we, someone, for example, prays hands here. Someone prays hands here. Someone prays with hands on the side. And these things have become argumentative things. And on this basis, it's a religious base. If a brother holds his hands here, and someone holds his hands here, they're both praying salah, right? They're both established from hadith. If someone says amin quietly, someone says loudly, someone does rafa, then someone doesn't. Everything is established from hadith. If something wasn't from hadith, then there would be no space for it within the deen. We are intolerant towards these differences. Just imagine how far we've gone. The prophetic ideal was what? We don't look down upon any individual. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, you have no father and no greatness. There's an Arab, an Arab over a non-Arab, black or white, rich or poor. In Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum, wa la ila amwalikum, wa lakin yanzuru ila qulubikum, wa a'amalikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at your, at your, at your zahir, your apparent, apparent. He doesn't look at your wealth. He looks at what? Your hearts. He looks at your action. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at. We should look at each other exactly the same. And we should make ta'wil for individuals. We should try to have husnul dhan. If we see someone, I gave you, remember I, I, I'll rewind you and tell you the example. I told you about my uncle who fell outside the pub, hurt himself. And someone said, even though he was waiting at the bus stop, someone phoned my grandfather, yeah, he's out water, but the pub do water. He fell outside the pub. Yeah, technically it wasn't a lie because the pub is 20 meters here, he's here. So he is outside, but where was he waiting? And remember I told you that example, someone phoned up a house, he said, oh, I, there's a man in your house, bro. But it was, not, it was his, the woman's brother. See that sort of one, what it led to? It led to arguments, fights and feuds. If you can cut it out of the jar, these wouldn't even take place. There's a possibility that there's a ta'wil to that person's answers. Do you understand? And if, and this is the job of ulama and mufti and ikram and, and the, if, it's for them to pass fatawa and, and advise the ummah. For us as individuals, it's not really our job to go around correcting, passing fatwa on individual. Worry about ourselves. Yes, something is sari, absolutely open. Then obviously, then there's no ta'wil possible. Fair enough.
And I don't want to start giving examples, there's plenty in the markets for examples. But I'm saying, where it's possible, just and then where it's possible, we should have husnul done for our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. And try not to find faults and try to look for differences of feuding or fighting. When the ummah becomes one, then you'll see the full potential in this ummah. If you look at each other's difficulties, small ikhtilafat, small minor, minor, minor issues and differences amongst us, wallah, we'll be arguing like this until the day of judgment.